So my name is uh, Sandra Chaminet. Um, welcome, everyone, to my. Uh, sorry? Oh, okay. Um, so, welcome to my presentation building a 3D uh, file import service um, with 3JS. Um, basically, well, this morning we heard uh, Chris Hadfield talk about failure, um, that it's important as a learning experience. Basically, we had tons of failure. Uh, and the, the biggest failure of all was uh, uh, the, that the company that I used to work for is now bankrupt. <laughs> so um, we're going to show here, because um, we were a bit uh, of an early adopter uh, of uh, the whole uh, cloud uh, infrastructure to start with, and secondly, uh, also uh, uh, 3D uh, for the web which was uh, in 2015 when we started with this, it was still a bit hard to export decent formats out of uh, FME that could be used in a, in a, in a, in a 3D web environment. Because uh, as we saw in your presentation, right, you now have the cesium 3D tiles, which I gladly would have liked to be using that, but uh, unfortunately that, that didn't exist in 2015. Uh, my colleagues, uh, they were, not a big fan of cesium when I showed them to them. I was I just started working at the company then, and you know, and you're 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 just a new guy, and he's he has all kinds of blah blah. But no one listens to you. You have to make your make your mark. You know, after a year or so, then they start to respect you. So they just said, well, let's make this 3D web application, build it on uh, 3JS. Before that, when I came in, it was all based on the City Engine uh, web viewer from uh, from Esri. And the only customers we had were also City Engine users. Uh, so they could upload a 3WS, and that whole file, that whole JSON file, was then unzipped on the fly and parsed in, and, into, uh, uh, and loaded into the, the City Engine viewer. But we wanted more, uh, more control and different users as well. So we decided to uh, build our own viewer uh, based on 3JS, uh, which, once again, wasn't my choice. But that's just how it is. So um, these requirements were then made up in 2015. Uh, first, we needed to be able to uh, still, uh, of course, provide uh, services to the 3WS users. So that uh, ne still needed to be uh, converted to, um, to 3GS. And later, we wanted to add SketchUp and Google Earth and more formats uh, to come. But this was the initial plan. Uh, we needed to be able to deal with coordinate systems. It all had to be cloud-based so that it could integrate well, and we don't have any, any uh, uh, dedicated servers that we needed to maintain and so on. Um, and it had to be web-ready so that uh, the files it produced could be read by 3JS immediately without any custom parser uh, on our behalf. Uh, and it needed to be done in a couple of months. So, well, I was just a newbie at the company. I was like, how am I going to do this? Um, I know one tool that can read a lot of formats and uh, is uh, nice, especially for, for rapid prototyping purposes, and that's FME. So I started off with uh, uh, an interesting journey. Um, and uh, so the biggest challenge was, uh, well, first I started playing with FME Cloud, because that was you know, just, just taking off. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's the way we should go. So I made a little workbench. Um, uploaded the workspace to, um, uh, um, to the FME Cloud, and it had a um, SketchUp reader in it. And it didn't work. And I was like, ooh, that's a bit of a letdown. Because SketchUp uses uh, an SDK that is only there for Mac and Windows, uh, and uh, not for Linux, where FME Cloud was uh, running on. So. Uh, this, that started this whole <laughs> crazy operation that we basically needed to recreate FME Cloud in a Windows environment, which back then also Docker was not something that was available yet. Well, it's still not uh, really uh, uh, working well, I think. It's, uh, it's getting there, but... <laughs> um, so we came up with this, um, and, uh, well, typically... So a user would be sitting there on that computer, the, the front end. <laughs> um, they would upload um, a file, um, a 3D file a model that will be put in S3. Um, and then uh, through the back end of the website, uh, which was running on Node.js, 
um, that would then uh, do a job submit REST uh, query to the, to the FME server. Uh, that would work its magic, and once it's done, it would uh, send an SQS notification back to our backend. Um, we chose SQS because, well, sometimes the, the backend might go down or whatever, and then uh, this, this converted 3D file never came in to the, to the user. So uh, once the, the backend was back online, then it would see, hey, there's still an SQS message in the queue, and then it would fetch all the data related to the, to the model. Um, then at the background, there was a Lambda script. Uh, like every five minutes, it would pull the, the status of FME server, see if jobs were piling up, report to CloudWatch, uh, and theoretically, uh, we had, I mean, we had it working, but we never used it because we hardly had any customers. But uh, we, <laughs> if it, uh, CloudWatch could then scale up the whole thing. Uh, these engines you see there, they are running in, in auto-scaling subnets. Is everyone still following me? I don't know how much AWS knowledge everyone has. Okay. <laughs> Just ask uh, any questions uh, if we still have time. Um, so uh, yeah, then the, um, the output of the job was then written back to S3 part, uh, partially. That was the, like the 3D meshes and everything and the textures. And uh, we also had a record in the MongoDB database that told us what kind of object it was. Uh, sometimes objects contain attribute data and we wanted to manipulate that attribute data. So we put that in the database for easy uh, uh, editing. Um, and the 3D files, they were never supposed to be edited. You could, you could move a model in your 3D space, uh, but you, you were not supposed to edit it because, I mean, that was pretty advanced stuff and we were not planning on doing that yet, maybe in the future. Well, not anymore now, but. Um, anyway, let's focus on the part on the right. Uh, so, uh, oh yeah, and just everything in the dotted line was then running indirectly or directly on Amazon uh, technology. We do realize there's a CDN 77. This is a Swiss provider for uh, uh, distribution. Um, we had, um, what was it, CloudFront first, but we weren't really happy with the performance, so we moved to, uh, to CDN. So that's the only thing that's not AWS. Um, so uh, to, to focus on the purely the FME side of things, um, ideally you would do something on the right. That's the easy way and also the best way to do it. So don't look to the stuff on the left now. Uh, that's what we implemented on the left. And why did we implement that? So we have one server core, and then we have the development, production, and stage tiers there. We didn't use test. Of course, we tested what we tested in stage and development. Um, and uh, these, these tiers have one core that they uh, communicate with. Ideally, thank you. <laughs> Ideally, you would have uh, uh, everything like clonable. So you start with a development and a dedicated server core to that, and then you would take that whole bundle and then deploy to stage and move it on to production if you're, if you're happy with it. Um, I think, I don't know how it works, I think FME Cloud uses the solution on the, on the right as well. We have dedicated servers and, and, um, um, and engines there. Um, they're agnostic of, uh, of each other, basically. Um, but we had to, uh, well, the reason why we chose the stuff on the left was we had more control over uh, how the licenses uh, were used, because we, we, well, we never paid for any licenses. We got them as a courtesy from, uh, from FME. And uh, I'm not supposed to say that, yeah. And <laughs> uh, we, well, we got six. Well, he, well they asked, they asked how, how many do you need? And said, well, let's just start modest and we use six. Because eventually the idea was to, to start paying for it. Uh, but we, uh, we wanted like two or three for production and the other ones were used for testing and, and for stage uh, purposes. Um, so uh, by doing it on the left, uh, we had, to use job tags. Uh, and in the, in the configuration, in the FME server configuration, you can specify these tags. And for all the engines, all the potential engines in each subnet, we created a, an entry uh, in the job tag section. Uh, so we had like a maximum of 10 engines, for instance, per subnet. 
uh, that were potentially there, and then it could scale within that range. So it was sort of semi-limited scaling, uh, uh, but, uh, but it did work. And uh, on the engines, there were PowerShell scripts uh, so uh, that could read an EC2 tag, so you had the control to start an engine that was, uh, and you, you fed it with the IP of the core uh, so that it knew to which core it should connect. And then some other tags, like uh, if it was a development engine or so on, and then it started up, it would fill in uh, some variables in all the configuration uh, files in the, on the engine and uh, then it would uh, start running, and it, it worked. It was maybe not a really nice solution, but it worked. Um, so now the, the final stage that we ended up with was these formats that we could import, uh, whereas the last edition was in January, I think it was IFC, um, the only BIM format, really. Um, we converted everything to, uh, to surfaces, uh, so the solids were converted to, to surface meshes. Um, um, so yeah, a, a bit about the format we write. So that's 3JS, which is nothing more than, than JSON. Uh, we zipped it. Um, it's, it has a loose specification. There's no official uh, way how to write it. We basically reverse engineered the one from Clara IO uh, because they were quite leading in, in how to deal with uh, 3JS. Um, the textures, that was a bit of a, a thing. Uh, they need to be a, 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 a square in a sense that they need to be a power of two in size, so 512 times 512. So we constantly needed to detect if a texture that came in, if that, was, if that fitted that, that, um, uh, that power of two, and we uh, were scaling it otherwise to the nearest power of two uh, so that 3JS could, uh, could load it. Um, 3JS doesn't have a spatial reference or anything, but we did store a center point of each scene, and that was stored in a database. So it could be, uh, and we were creating bounding boxes of all the buildings and objects that people imported, so they could also be placed on a, on a map, which we showed uh, next to that. Um, so yeah, this is the scene graph of uh, 3JS. So in yellow, you see that the meshes is what we stored, comprised of uh, geometry and materials and the images we stored separately in something we called the, the image dump, which was just a S3 bucket with, filled with tons and tons of images. Um, the nice thing is that these images could then be reused, of course. Um, we output also to MongoDB. Uh, that's a popular technology used in, uh, for web applications, of course, in the mean stack. So you have Mongo, Express, Angular, and, and Node.js. Um, uh, well, in 2016, this, this write, read write support for MongoDB uh, showed up in FME. We were like, hallelujah, that's nice. Let's use that. But it didn't support replica sets, uh, which on the production we definitely needed. Uh, so we couldn't write out to those. Uh, and there was no validation. And of course, you can say, well, it's schemaless, yes. So what do you expect? But you need some kind of validation to make sure that you're not putting utter junk in there. Um, so then uh, I started looking to, once again, the Python caller to the rescue, and I found a library called Mongo Engine, built on top of the PyMongo library. Uh, and that could do, you could just give it a, um, a schema, uh, or actually just a, a Python class that was the definition of the schema, and then it would validate uh, all your data accordingly. Um, logging, we created a... Uh, a Python class that was initiated uh, during a startup. Um, and that Python class could then be called from a status report or custom transformer that we had, uh, so to do it the, in a nice FME way. And we could also call it directly from any Python caller scripts, and we had a lot of Python caller scripts in the whole thing, um, uh, to also log issues, because the, the, it was very important that this workbench, this, sorry, workspace, I always say workbench, uh, this workspace would never crash. And if it crashed, then, um, you know, then we also, well, we had a fallback mechanism t for that, but it always needed to report something, because you cannot leave a user with a hanging, with a hanging job. It needed to, something needed to come back. Uh, so in this reporter, we had a, a dictionary that was just counting the amounts of 
uh, textures that were dropped because of some, some issue that they had or geometries that were incorrect and were also dropped because they had errors in them. Um, all these validation things were ending up in there. And then on the shutdown script, it would write to MongoDB all these uh, errors uh, at once. But not, of course, 20 times like this texture failed, that texture failed, but just uh, uh, like two textures were dropped because of some reason, so that the user had some kind of feedback on, uh, on what was going wrong. And if MongoDB was down for some reason, that was like a severe error, of course, and then we got uh, a Slack message that's saying like there is a, something bad is, uh, is really happening now, you need to check this. Um, we were working in an agile development team. We used Bitbucket, Git, uh, Jira to create issues and make new uh, feature requests and so on. We had unit test, made a nose, uh, and we ran it to, through Jenkins, so on each commit that would build the whole thing and see if it, uh, everything was okay. Unfortunately, we never came up to the point to have integration tests. I would have loved that, but uh, yeah, uh, it didn't happen so far. But it always proved hard to test all cases. It's, it's unbelievable what crap people sometimes upload. Uh, also stuff with nothing in it. You know, it's just, what are you testing? You know, nothing. <laughs> uh, but even those cases, you, you, you need to check everything or aggregates inside aggregates, inside aggregates, and, and then some empty thing there, empty geometry and null geometry, and uh, everything would explode. Well, Owen, uh, you probably know all the, <laughs> all the issues uh, with that. Um, um, yeah, so we had lots of hot fixes usually uh, on release. Um, and then there was a, a pull request uh, for, for logged issues so that we, on a new release, we could uh, fix those things. This is the monster <laughs> that I created. I know it's, it's maybe bad practice, I don't know. Um, Lots of custom transformers in here, lots of Python. It's, uh, it's like I said, it's the hard way to do things. Um, this is the data preparation per format. On the top you see 3WS, which is JSON that needs to be converted to generic FME, so uh, uh, internal format. Uh, and then below it is Google Earth, then SketchUp, then uh, FBX, OBJ Colada, and at the bottom is IFC which actually is a lot more complicated, but uh, they were all wrapped in custom transformers. Um, so we tried to extract all the attributes from it, make objects, so like to take care that buildings were really buildings and not that trees were also in there. And so we did lots of detection things and smart stuff that the user never knew about, but. Uh. And then um, this is the generic part, so you have the the, uh, there you read the parameters. We had a few input parameters, but because the parameters were mainly dynamic, we also fetched from MongoDB uh, some parameters. Um, and then, uh, then it determines which pipeline to go through. And then you have the, uh, this is the generic writing where the FME internal format is converted to 3JS, written out to Mongo and to uh, S3. That was it. Uh, thank you very much. That's a good. That's a good one. I, yeah, yeah. I, I had a slide actually with that, but I was like, I, I'm not going to make it. So. Uh, uh, well, I, I think now that we would, also 3JS has now a, a binary reader for uh, GLTF. Uh, so I would definitely write out everything to GLTF, which is a, a real format. <laughs> uh, if I also had to say again, I would do everything in cesium. Uh, but my colleagues, they were against it because it looked horrible. Uh, horrible. I totally agree with that, by the way. But uh, of course, with style sheets and everything, you can customize the whole thing to, to uh, look a lot nicer. Uh, but you know, that has a, like a, it's a through uh, 3IS based uh, web renderer, right? So um, that's, uh, that's better than 3JS in, in my opinion. But, so yeah, those are a few of the things I would have done differently. And there's tons more, but we can talk. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.